Hey, um, Adam Petrick with Excellence in Ed. Um, so a question, we've been talking about how we don't like the current system, but we don't know what the new system should be. And I, I've talked about this before, so some of you have probably heard this. I think we have almost all that we need in, a, in, a, in a certain ways. Um, because I think we're talking about two different things. We're talking about accountability to parents is one, or accountability to the people that are overseeing schools. Those are two different things. If we think that parents know best, and that's kind of our guiding principle, and that we think if we empower parents with information that they're gonna vote with their feet, then why aren't we doing a better job of capturing what parents know? So an example of this is in, health, in the um, departments of health. I lived in DC for five years. Never once did I go to the, department, the city department of health's rating system to see if it had an A, a, B, whatever the rating is. I go to Yelp once a week, right? I go to Yelp all the time. Because I intuitively know that a five star or four star rated Yelp restaurant probably doesn't have mice in it, probably isn't giving people food poisoning. It probably isn't going to be something where I'm gonna put myself at risk. But I think the way that we do education policy now, there's a little bit of hubris in it that we do, that we can rank order schools from one to 10 on these objective metrics. When in reality, that's like saying on the automaker, you're evaluated on your miles per gallon. Now with that evaluation, you're probably gonna turn out some cars with a much better miles per gallon, but you're probably gonna lose a lot of the other innovations that, were, that are coming out too, you know, side mirrors that can detect cars coming by, all the other things that we take for granted. So my question is, isn't it a light regulatory footprint and a kind of nudging of parents to require parents to rate their satisfaction with their provider, especially in a school system of choice, an ESA program, or a voucher program where parents are voluntarily going to a school, saying as part of that accountability feature, at the end of the school year, after you make the payment, whatever it is, you rate on one through five, and you can give an even more detailed rating if you want to, but at least a one through five, so we're capturing what parents know to drive decisions, because how we do it now is, parents know best, they find out it's a crummy school, they leave, no one else knows, mm. right? So how can we use rating systems? And I think it probably requires more than just a great schools model, I like great schools, but I think you need some government intervention to kind of incentivize or get p parents to want to participate in this so that we're capturing all experiences okay. and not just the extremes, right? Okay. So, and another thing, with Yelp. We gotta make it real quick. With, with one quick, with Yelp, they're putting now in cities, they're putting Department of Health ratings on Yelp because no one goes to the Department of Health, right? They realize they're smart enough to know that parents are going to Yelp, mm -hmm. or uh, patrons are going to Yelp, so they're putting that data on top of it where it's actually gonna be seen. So why couldn't this be the system? Right. Who wants to take it first? New York City does school climate surveys. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with them, uh, and I'm not sure that you need every parent. I mean, if we can know who's gonna win for president next Tuesday by surveying 1,000 people, do we need everybody in the school? But I mean, I, I'm not sure what other cities do, but I think New York, New York City does. And I, what I don't know is what effect that has, though, which is the better question. It's interesting, you're, uh, you know, we're metaphor rich up here between wolves and puppies and pharaohs. Uh, but I've always preferred this one of, uh, you know, the, the Department of Health coming in saying, at least you won't leave with trichinosis if you go to this restaurant. But we don't know about the food preparation, the quality, you know, relative to you know, is it organic and so forth, until we get to know that restaurant. And you know, we, we have begun, as a network, really surveying parents extensively. It's one of the, the performance indicators that we take note of because we value that. I, I just don't know how that would look, again, on a policy level, trying to bring it together, except if Tom's idea of something like a profile emerged uh, that included parents' response to and, and experience with the school. I think they're very sympathetic, by the way, right? I find, not just to us, I think to our schools generally, right? I think as, as Americans, as parents, we love our schools, right? They've got our most treasured possession. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think we give them a lot of latitude. That is to say, if parents start to gripe, that's a pretty good indication something may be amiss. Mm -hmm. There may be some value to that. I just don't know how it'd be put into play. In the DC voucher model, there's actually a built-in component to evaluate parent satisfaction and a couple of Jay's colleagues, uh, Tom Stewart and Patrick Wolf, have written a book about that. And there's other states who use uh, tax credit scholarships who have uh, built in parental satisfaction. So, very good point. My question was going to take four, but all right. Um, <laughs> Bob Bellafiore from Stanhope Partners in New York. Um, uh, and I, I have worked with authorizers trying to close schools and schools trying to deal with the threat of closure. 
So let me ask you this. Jay, you said the accountability movement is dying or maybe dead. Tom, you said we need more different kind of accountability measurements. So let me ask you this and introduce a new non-animal metaphor. <laughs> what goes on the pallet that authorizers work off of and that schools can recognize so they know what the rules are? Because this is a great theoretical discussion and the most often heard word today is should. As my pastor said, to suggest us to volunteer. So what's the pallet look like in a practical world for an authorizer and a school who are just trying to do the right thing the right way? All right. And gentlemen, if you can wait, answer your question, then we'll ask, ask. Yep, and then we'll just work so My question is, is to Tom. Um, I'm really struck by what you said about um, schools knowing what's going on with their kids. So two questions about that. One is, how much subjective stuff would you consider in that? And, and two is, how wide a frame do I need to go? Do I need to go just with parents and the school itself, or do I need to go to the community, or do I need to go to the, to the national level? Where does that stop? All right, and I also want to make sure that uh, Robert has a chance to respond to what uh, Tommy said earlier. So we'll start off with Tom. On the question on authorizing, uh, we ought to have four or five, maybe six different lanes of Authorizing One ought to be a fast path. If you run good schools, you ought to get free pass to open as many schools as you want. Uh, if you want to open an experimental school, there ought to be a sheltered form of uh, short cycle evaluation that might go from, um, you know, a summer school trial that turns into a pop-up micro school that turns into a larger school, subject to both uh, observational and, uh, and, and testing. So. Uh, I, I wasted a couple million dollars trying to open schools in New York and New Jersey when it was illegal to do anything different. And then it became illegal to, for anybody to do a, a for-profit, right? Um, so we ought to have a, 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 an innovative schools authorizing system that in, encourages, doesn't make illegal, uh, efforts to try things differently. On, on the second question, um, I'd like a really rich learner profile that includes a lot of qualitative and quantitative feedback. As much of that as possible ought to be a, against a, a rubric that makes it at least judgments against a, a agreed upon set of um, desired outcomes, but that would certainly include subjective information. Right, well, like when you said that, but what's on the pallet? What are those things that are in the rich yeah. I, I think those things could be considered by uh, and should be considered by a, uh, an authorizer as part of a broad dashboard. See what other folks think. Yeah, so, so, so I, I think the the you're looking for the answer in the wrong place. Uh, so I'd be worried about a school that was focused on. Uh, trying to please its authorizer and comply with what its authorizer wants. That's, the, I think, the wrong way to go about it. I think the right way to go about it is, is to have a vision for a school, execute on that vision, do a good job, and trust that it'll kind of work out. So it's a little bit like my advice to, to my students who go off into tenure-track jobs, and I advise them, don't work for tenure where you are, work for tenure. Um, so, you know, someone will, if you're a good school, uh, and you're executing on your vision, then someone will authorize you and you'll be fine. And so if you run around trying to, well look, and, and if it's the case that authorizers are arbitrarily closing good schools and they can't get authorized by someone else, then, then, then we should get rid of authorizers because that's stupid. Okay. I, I just was, uh, I was curious whether anything like the accrediting model that we find in higher education with its standards broadly defined to represent best in class or, or guild activity could in some way uh, provide some of this accountability uh, around, again, broadly open rubric uh, uh, that, that, that takes into account the school's financial profile, school's culture, uh, you know, the more subjective aspects, a school's curriculum and coherence thereof. I mean, would, would that be the kind of thing, again, assuming we had a guild of some uh, weight that could, you know, that could weigh in, rather, uh, that, that that might be an analog? But I'm not, you know, I, I don't know if there's anything quite like it in this space uh, as of yet. Okay. We'll end up with uh, our friend to the left. 
you know, I'm, I'm ending where I began. I've, I've got that wolf by the ears again. And because, um, you know, Jay, I'm, I'm with you again on 99.9% .9 of what you're saying until you get to that line about you got to trust that it's going to work out. We have a too long of a history, Marcus said it quite well, of, of schools that have not worked out for the, the kids who can least afford schools that don't work out. Um, for, for most of us, it's going to be, be fine. But for those who can least afford it, it's not going to be fine. And I don't have an answer. And as you've seen, we've had very diverse ideas on what assessment, uh, knowledge, and learning looks like. The thing I'd like to leave us with is this. When we talk about students uh, and adults, we talk about uh, human beings, when in fact what we are are humans being. And once we realize the action point, we'll begin to look at ourselves very different, differently and assess ourselves very differently. So with that, let's thank the panelists.